Hello, and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. Introducing Rudderstack Profiles. Rudderstack Profiles takes the SaaS guesswork and SQL grunt work out of building complete customer profiles so you can quickly ship actionable, enriched data to every downstream team. You specify the customer traits, then Profiles runs the joins and computations for you to create complete customer profiles. Get all of the details and try the new product today at dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Rudderstack. You shouldn't have to throw away the database to build with fast-changing data. You should be able to keep the familiarity of SQL and the proven architecture of cloud warehouses, but swap the decades-old batch computation model for an efficient incremental engine to get complex queries that are always up to date. With Materialize, you can. It's the only true SQL streaming database built from the ground up to meet the needs of modern data products. Whether it's real-time dashboarding and analytics, personalization and segmentation, or automation and alerting, Materialize gives you the ability to work with fresh, correct, and scalable results, all on a familiar SQL interface. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash materialize today to get two weeks free. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Jay Mishra about the applications for generative AI and the ETL process. So Jay, can you start by introducing yourself? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, Tobias. Uh, this is Jay Mishra. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Estera. I have been in this field for over t- uh, two decades, uh, specifically with the data management over 13 years. And I've been party to a lot of implementations at Fortune 500 companies uh, for the ETL implementations, uh, for data warehousing implementations, for various other use cases under the umbrella of data management. I have participated uh, from the beginning all the way to the end, including uh, implementations using our tool set. And do you remember how you first got started working in data? Interesting story. Uh, we had a small module in our uh, product um, that did uh, user-friendly data mapping. So it was basically a very simple ETL tool that is designed for non-programmers. Back then, it was a novel idea to give uh, a GUI-based tool to the people uh, who were doing ETL uh, it was mostly about schema mapping and transformations. We presented it to one of our largest customers, and they liked it. And uh, that's how our journey started. And of course, over the years, we got a lot of feedback from customers, market, kept adding features, uh, took the feedback of our customers very seriously, and uh, kept building upon it. And uh, yeah, 12 years later, here we are. We have a full data stack uh, that is able to ingest data transform, of course, uh, load into any architectures of your choice, whether it is a data vault or a star schema or any other uh, choice that you have for architecture for data warehousing, and uh, then publish it to your, your end users using uh, uh, no-code, uh, low-code APIs. Uh, so we have, at this point, a full platform that is able to ingest data all the way to publish your data and everything in between. And in the context of ETL, what are some of the different ways that you're seeing generative AI applied and some of the types of impact that you would expect for practitioners who want to be able to just say, give me this data, bring it over there. I don't want to have to care about the details. Excellent question. Uh, so this is something that we are seeing um, being asked of us, uh, actually, as, a, uh, as an ETL vendor. Uh, very frequently. It started about a couple of years ago. The impact of AI on the entire data space, I would say, not only ETL, overall data management, that started to happen about a couple of years ago. We also jumped in around the same time. And uh, we see various areas getting impacted uh, by AI, specifically generative AI. So starting with uh, the data ingestion itself, the E in ETL is extraction. And uh, we see that extraction piece is uh, heavily impacted with the uh, AI. Uh, wherever you have unstructured data, data that is text-based, um, data that has uh, images, all those areas are getting um, helped quite a bit with the uh, AI. And uh, extraction piece, uh, if it is structured data, not so much because the structured data, AI still has inaccuracies. Uh, but unstructured data is where it is helping in a big way. Now, coming to transformations, there also we see that some teams uh, of data engineers uh, are using actually AI to generate code for transformations, data quality as well. And uh, schema mapping is another one where uh, AI is impacting. And then um, overall, 
automation. In my opinion, this is the area where AI has made the, the biggest impact, where you can look at repetitive tasks in the entire solution design and development and uh, use AI to automate it. So the usability has gone up, user experience has changed significantly. So the user interfaces to the um, uh, what used to be GUI, now it is going one level up. We are seeing actually chatbot style uh, interfaces uh, to various applications, including some areas in ETL, for example, data prep. In fact, our own data prep um, functionality now has an interface where you, you can speak uh, or you can just chat in plain English and give instructions about what you need to do with your data. And uh, AI is able to generate the right uh, script or right uh, metadata for it and do the work for you. So this is how we are seeing uh, uh, AI impacting various areas. But to me, the two standouts would be usability and helping repetitive tasks automation. So these two will stand out. And of course, uh, other areas uh, are also getting impacted by decision making that, uh, that is done by typically users. AI is doing helping actually in parts to make the decision for you. And for the integration of these AI capabilities in the ETL process, how does that shift the intended user of that technology where in a straight ETL environment, Typically, you would see that be the responsibility of a data engineer, but as you were mentioning, there are also tools or scenarios where there are non-technologists who are domain experts or business experts who want to be able to do that work. How does the application of AI shift that equation of who is responsible for actually doing this data integration work? Yeah, uh, that is also changing um, rapidly, actually. That whole uh, responsibilities distribution uh, is changing. Uh, we see that more and more business-facing people, people who have uh, no background in coding, uh, uh, no technical background, they are able to take uh, some responsibilities off the shoulders of, uh, uh, for lack like, like of better term, data people. So people who are responsible for data, they are delegating some of the responsibilities. So the cross-functional teams, uh, the nature of that team is changing as well. And uh, in terms of uh, the data engineers and uh, the ETL developers, that's the original word, uh, original term for the people who are actually developing the solution, the role is shifting a little bit. And actually it is shifting in the right direction. Uh, in my opinion, they should not be tasked with doing uh, the same task again and over again for several, uh, no, we have seen in implementations for several weeks, several months, you are doing very similar tasks. So for example, if you're doing a, a data integration task and you have uh, dozens of tables on the source side and you're building a pipeline, you are building the similar pipelines for each of these entities and it takes days, sometimes weeks. So this is the kind of task where you don't want to spend your data engineer's time. Rather, they should be focusing on the task that is really uh, interesting and it is adding more value. So the repeti uh, any, any task that is, being, uh, that is repeti uh, repetitive, that is uh, being automated. And uh, data engineers are able to focus on more interesting and more valuable tasks. So that's how we, sh we see the, the role shifting. And uh, the subject matter experts, they are also coming to the, uh, in, into the picture. So they're working closely with the data engineers. So that's how we see the dynamics uh, changing um, uh, in the teams that are implementing uh, the uh, data solutions. You mentioned a little bit as to the specific types of projects or specific types of data where generative AI is going to provide the most impact, but I'm wondering if we can dig a bit deeper into that, where you were saying that for highly structured use cases, it's you know maybe an incremental win, but with unstructured data is where you're going to see the largest gains. I'm wondering if you can talk to some of the reasons that that is and some of the ways that teams should be thinking about their initial forays into applying AI to their ETL use cases. Right. So structured versus unstructured, uh, that debate has been going on for some time. And we see that uh, unstructured data, when you're extracting data from that, it's mostly insight. You're looking at taking a portion of it and uh, a little bit of approximation is okay. So for example, if you have a document and you want to uh, get a summary of that document, that summary doesn't have to be exact. Whereas if you're looking at a table that where you have structured uh, rows and columns, in aggregation, even a small difference is not okay. So that's how I, I look at it. And we see that uh, 
AI by nature is going to be non-deterministic. It has uh, sometimes seemingly errors, but if it is 95% accurate, is that acceptable if you're dealing with a structured data? Whereas with unstructured data, 95% accurate is pretty good. So that's the key difference between uh, the structured versus uh, unstructured data. And uh, unstructured data scenarios, uh, in fact, uh, we saw that in recent past, all the rule-based solutions, they are being replaced completely. So rule-based solutions used to be that, hey, I'm looking for, in NL, using maybe uh, NLP, then in proximity of uh, this keyword, look at these other keywords, and if they're matching with the context, give me this in, uh, this information. That's how it used to be. But now with the with the AI, specifically generative AI, you do the similarity search and you you create and you put in your vector DB and then you create like uh, top five uh, matching ones. You send it to AI. Um, let's say for example, uh, OpenAI uh, GPT, and uh, the results are pretty good. So we did experiments and uh, the insights coming out of those calls are really good for an unstructured data. Now, we did the same experiment with, us, uh, with structured data, sending a table and asking for certain calculations and all that, and it will have hallucinations. And those are kind of uh, indicators of uh, uh, with the structured data that approximation is not going to work. So with the structured data, where we see AI helping is uh, where AI can be used to configure the existing ETL solutions and uh, automate it. So instead of X number of hours, you're spending only half X numbers of hours uh, or one, one quarter maybe to configure the solution and your savings are there. So AI on un, uh, unstructured data is involved completely. The structured data, it is helping in configuring the solution and making the usability or user experience go up. To your point of needing to bring your data into the context of the vector DB for doing that similarity search, not quite yet, but a little further along, I want to talk through some of the architectural aspects of being able to integrate AI into the ETL process. But another aspect of that similarity search brings up the question of entity extraction and entity resolution. I'm curious what you're seeing as the impact of these AI models for being able to simplify or accelerate the process of doing that uh, entity resolution or master data management for the ETL end result? Yes, uh, the metadata. You bring up a very uh, important point. Um, that is something that uh, we see where AI is helping in a big way. Not the data, but the metadata itself. Because metadata, again, is a decision-making uh, process. So when someone is, uh, let's say, a data architect, is looking at the data, doing the, the initial stages of uh, data discovery, looking at what I'm dealing with. So a lot of uh, concepts of uh, metadata are coming from, from that stage where you're looking at your data and trying to figure out what you're dealing with. And a lot of decision making is involved there. So not only in MDM, we are seeing it in all different areas where you're looking at the data and uh, letting AI do the at least initial cut for you and then review it. And which, if you like, you move forward with that. That is the model that we see being applied at design time, specifically applied to metadata. One example that comes to my mind is uh, data modeling. So related to MDM, of course, if you're looking at your, your source data and you want to create your entity, uh, the ER framework, that is, uh, you're looking at uh, building a model where you want to decide that what makes sense and uh, what kind of uh, entities you want to create. And also moving forward, Let's say that you want to design a data warehouse. In data warehouse, what could be a candidate for your facts or your dimensions? Uh, if you're dealing with a data vault, what could be your hubs and satellites and links? All those things basically take time. So practitioners, they spend quite a bit of time in making those determinations and then uh, curating it. And that's how the design process works. And we are seeing that AI applied can do the first cut for you in a matter of few seconds. And then the first cut, if it is 90% there, your work is reduced by 90%. So that's the gain that we are seeing with the AI in all of the metadata-based decisions. So wherever you're trying to handle uh, metadata-related decision-making, AI is, is helping in a big way. And now, as far as the architectural aspects and the workflow, you mentioned needing to have some of these uh, contextual cues to the language models. I'm wondering if you can just talk to some of the architectural and workflow aspects of being able to bring AI into the process of ETL 
rather than ETL being used to feed the feed the AI. So the ETL workflows uh, they don't change much. AI comes into the ETL flow in different stages. At least for now, it's changing rapidly, and we'll we'll come to that question a little later. But at least at this point, what we are seeing is that the ETL workflow stays the same, and for each of the steps, we see AI being applied. So let's uh, have a look at uh, a typical ETL workflow. The first step is data extraction. And in data extraction, we do have uh, traditional connectors that will go into your source, try to figure out the metadata. And if you have the metadata based on that, it, it will do the parsing of your data, bring in the right data into your pipeline, and then the, then the mapping starts. So in the first step, where you are trying to figure out the layout of your source data, when you're trying to read the data. So reading, of course, AI is not helping as much but figuring out what is the structure of your data. That part is uh, metadata building, and we see AI being used. In fact, we have released a feature uh, on uh, addressing exactly that point, where it is automatically able to figure out what source you're dealing with, what is the structure of it, uh, what are the columns and the, their data types, and so on and so forth. It can handle all of that. So this is AI being applied to the reading part. Now, if you have unstructured data, Sometimes you're dealing with, uh, for example, let's say um, we have tons of PDF documents, contains unstructured data that has paragraphs and tables hidden inside it. And uh, you have a specific prompt based on which you want to get certain data from each of these documents. Now that becomes your source. So this is your ingestion. You can apply maybe uh, a pre-trained uh, model or let's say that uh, a fine-tuned LLM. And we have done experiments with those as well, and it results are beautiful. So you can apply those at the ingestion stage itself to get you more quality data, more meaningful data. So that is the ingestion state. Now we go to the next step, that is uh, mapping, data mapping. In data mapping, again, it's, uh, it's a task that is meant for a combination of subject matter experts and people, of course, who are developing the solution. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of uh, trial and errors about, hey, this field, does it go here versus here? How do we combine it? And so on and so forth. And there also we are seeing um, AI helping in a big way. You can give the context to AI about this is the subject matter, and uh, here is a list of uh, my source fields. Here is a list of my destination candidates, and let it figure out. And we have seen that results again are pretty good. It can do the work in a matter of a second, a few seconds, instead of uh, going through a few iterations and coming up with this uh, this map, and then you're going to be verifying it uh, with your teams and all that. The first cut again is done very quickly. Of course, uh, the verification step is going to be there, but the mapping can be uh, done in let's say one tenth of the time that was required earlier. Then also in transformations, we are seeing that sometimes there are tools, of course, uh, like ours, where the transformations are drag and drop and you can map and uh, you can get going. But there are some tools that use coding. And uh, in those tools, of course, AI can help you with generating the transformation code automatically. So that is the transformation side and loading as well. Uh, if you're loading into, let's say, a data warehouse, loading is not easy. Now, you have to write very complicated SQL code uh, with the inserts and updates and, and so on and so forth. And uh, some tools, uh, they do have rule-based uh, solution that, that can automatically generate the code for you. But if you don't, you can use AI to generate the code for you. So AI is being used as kind of a assistant or, or a helping hand in all the different stages at this point, keeping the same workflow for the ETL. Documentation is where uh, the last step, I would say, where, again, AI is helping where you can uh, generate the documentation uh, by giving it the context and giving your models and uh, the pipelines. And it can describe your pipelines in a, in a pretty, uh, I would say, a reasonable way uh, where you can generate a docu document that is going to be describing your ETL pipeline. So that's how we see uh, AI uh, getting plugged into different uh, stages of ETL workflow at this point. Later, uh, we are seeing this area advance pretty quickly. So uh, we are expecting it to not only help in all different areas, but also the decision-making that is at this point kind of limited to a localized area, it may kind of uh, grow from there and make bigger decisions, such as, hey, you know, I am looking at these five sources. Can I automatically join these five and give you meaningful data in my destination? So dynamic ETL, real-time ETL, and all that, that's where the future is going. 
but that again, that is, uh, we are not there yet, but we see that the AI can help in uh, those areas as well in future. This episode is brought to you by Datafold, a testing automation platform for data engineers that finds data quality issues before the code and data are deployed to production. Datafold leverages data diffing to compare production and development environments and column level lineage to show you the exact impact of every code change on data, metrics, and BI tools, keeping your team productive and stakeholders happy. Datafold integrates with DBT, the modern data stack, and seamlessly plugs in your data CI for team wide and automated testing. If you are migrating to a modern data stack, Datafold can also help you automate data and code validation to speed up the migration. Learn more about Datafold by visiting dataengineeringpodcast.com slash datafold today. And as far as the model selection, that is an area that is constantly moving with the OpenAI GPT models, grabbing a lot of the headlines and attention, but the open source models are also very quickly leapfrogging each other and catching up with the OpenAI models, as well as some of the ones available from Anthropic, et cetera. Has there been any feedback that you've seen as far as which models perform best for which use cases or for particular technology stacks? And I'm wondering what you see as some of the useful benchmarks or metrics for teams who are starting that evaluation process of, I want to bring in AI, but I need to be aware of some of the platform risk of depending on this for all of my day-to-day operations. So this area is changing uh, rapidly. When OpenAI started out and we got access to uh, OpenAI's APIs, uh, we did some experiments and followed by that quickly, we started to see a lot of these open source uh, LLMs coming out where, of course, the parameters are not as high as OpenAI, but they're reasonable, and you can have it a local copy of it. That was a huge deal because uh, with OpenAI, even if you are getting the best results, there are many issues where you have to uh, send everything uh, to OpenAI APIs, and the performance sometimes was not great. Uh, whereas uh, we started to play with Llama and for Meta. And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, at this point, we have uh, five or six uh, different uh, models that we offer in our tool set. And this is uh, given to the users where they can experiment with any of them, that they can fine tune it with their, uh, with their data. And once it is fine tuned to their data, they can use any of them. So that's how we present it. We are agnostic to which one do you use. But now coming back to your question about which one works better for which kind of data. So one pattern that we notice is uh, the performance, of course, if you're dealing with the unstructured data, chat GPT, that still stays at the top. The performance or the quality is about the best from there for unstructured data. We did one more experiment with uh, creating natural language interface for our own uh, expression language. So in our product, we have an expression language where you can write formulas to do calculations. And it looks like uh, formulas that you see in Microsoft Excel. That kind of uh, um, learning, not a whole lot, but still for some users, it is a bit difficult. That, hey, I have to write these formulas and expressions to do some calculations. So we did experiment over that uh, scenario where we gave a natural language interface to generate those formulas. And there we are seeing that uh, Llama is a pretty good option. It does pretty well. Llama 2 now. So uh, depending on the scenario, it changes that which one is going to be performing better. So what I would recommend is that experiment with all top four or five. It doesn't take much. Uh, there are tools like ours available now that are going to be, uh, that will give you a playground where you can experiment with uh, fine tuning the three or four models and see that which one works the best. Because it is not, at least in our experience, it is not that winner takes all. In certain areas, we see that OpenAI is doing much better than others, but there are some areas where others are doing better than OpenAI. So I would suggest to experiment and see that which one is the best fit for your kind of data. And the process and the, the tool set requirement, they are they're getting there already. There are many solutions available out there that are going to let you experiment. Now, the other fun piece of working with AI is that it is non-deterministic, and so there is the potential for logical errors, logical bugs to come in, and you're not even necessarily going to get the exact same output for the exact same input, especially if you're dealing with successive generations of models. 
I'm wondering what are some of the ways that teams need to be thinking about error handling, error identification, uh, validating the outputs of the AIs before they put it into production, et cetera? Great question. Uh, this is something that we have been dealing with even in our internal implementations and uh, even our, in our own, own coding that we did for the product. So, uh, of course, the stochastic nature of uh, the predictions makes it suitable for certain things, but not suitable for the other. We tend to recommend using AI where it is not going to be deterministic only for the design time. Don't let it be in the runtime. That is actually one of the principles that we have agreed upon, that if it is at the runtime, it is going to cause issues. And uh, the only way possibly to use it in, at runtime is to have a strong layer of data validations that will reject certain uh, things done by AI if it is not meeting your standards, and then it throws it back to you saying that, okay, hey, have a look at it. So that is the only way to use AI at runtime. Otherwise, at design time is where we see a lot of value. At design time, we see that uh, where uh, you are making decisions and uh, even um, implementations, uh, the first cut that is created by AI is way faster than even an expert of, let's say, 20 years or 25 years, 30 years um, will, will come up with. So we see a lot of gains on that front. And the benefit is, uh, uh, the biggest, uh, I would say, benefit is that once the recommendation is in front of you, you can review it and override it. So that capability you have to have. In your process, make sure that you have that built-in um, capability to review the work that is done by AI and override it if need be. So look at AI as your um, assistant who is helping you in doing some work. And you're not going to trust it blindly. You're going to look at the work done by AI, review it, and then if it looks good, sure, no problem at all. It goes to the next step. But if it doesn't, then you have a way to fix it, and then it goes to the next step. So mostly at design time, we are using it. And uh, we do have uh, some places where we let AI uh, handle certain pieces in the, at the runtime. But there, we make sure that you are using some kind of rule-based checking of the results. So data validation, um, the module uh, that we have that is, uh, uh, that is a must that you have to apply after the AI step. Any step that involves AI, after that, you have to have uh, data quality checks and data validation uh, to make sure that uh, at runtime, you have your eyes on AI. <laughs> That's how I put it. And you mentioned that you wisely don't incorporate the AI into the actual runtime behavior, but just in the design and implementation phase. And so for ongoing maintenance purposes, what do you see as the ongoing role of the AI as you maintain and evolve the different pipelines or try to implement new pipelines that maybe feed off of some of the ones that are already implemented, things like that? Right. Uh, so on that front, uh, the rule is increasing. And actually, I'll take that analogy of assistant. Uh, your assistant is being trained. They are doing certain tasks now, but once they are trained, they can do bigger tasks. So that rule is also evolving. And uh, we do see already uh, some, uh, some tool sets or some, some teams working on it. That is uh, where we increase the responsibility of AI to be our assistant to do monitoring of existing flows. So monitoring is another part where we see a huge role that AI can play. So here it is not impacting your real data, but it is helping you as a user that that would be your responsibility otherwise, to look into your data pipelines, how they're behaving, what kind of data you're getting at the end, any errors that you're receiving, uh, what is the frequency. So it is pretty good on that front. It can tell you that, hey, most likely this is what is going wrong and you can go and fix it. So data anomalies inside your metadata at runtime, your information that is coming out from runtime. If uh, we can have an eye into that process, that is very useful and AI can do that for us. So AI is being used to help us monitor the entire workflow that we have deployed at runtime. So that is one area. 
And uh, also for the areas of uh, design or implementation that, that we were talking about earlier, there uh, the role is getting more and more advanced, more complex. Um, so we are seeing that if you have uh, designed certain flows in past, and you were seeing that certain errors or certain issues that you're seeing with those flows, it can detect it. And also it can generate a recommendation about, hey, instead of using this flow, how about you try this flow? So that is, uh, again, uh, for design time, but a huge help because that is kind of troubleshooting. In troubleshooting, it takes time and uh, AI can do that work for you. So in these, these two areas, I see that uh, AI's role is gradually increasing. As more people start using AI for projects, two things are clear. It's a rapidly advancing field and it's tough to navigate. How can you get the best results for your use case? Instead of being subjected to a bunch of buzzword bingo, hear directly from pioneers in the developer and data science space on how they use graph tech to build AI-powered apps. Attend the Dev and ML Talks at Nodes 2023, a free online conference on October 26th featuring some of the brightest minds in tech. Check out the agenda and register today at neo4j.com slash nodes. That's N-E-O, the number four, j.com slash n-o-d-e-s for teams and individuals and organizations who are considering this introduction of ai into their critical data flows what are the typical motivators that you see and the types of questions and concerns that they need to address before they can feel comfortable with actually putting the results into production yeah so on this front uh, we are seeing that uh our customers uh, ask us this question uh, frequently now, that how should we approach it? How should we incorporate AI into our solution uh, design and uh, implementations? And uh, of course, they have uh, uh, some um, reservations about it as well, that should we be using AI or not? So from our side, we always suggest that uh, take your time, uh, come up with a strategy of how you want to incorporate AI uh, into your data solutions, your architecture, or overall, uh, the organization-wide, how you want to, uh, to start using AI. And uh, there are a few things that are important. The first one is that you have to identify the areas or the scenarios in which AI is applicable. Then there are the issues with the, the tooling that you need to have the right tool set available because that can make or break and then, of course, the training of your resources. That is also very important. They need to be trained properly in using AI because uh, if it is not done properly, you're not going to get any value out of it. Now, coming to uh, the reservations or objections to AI, and uh, there are many reasons for that. The first one that comes up is uh, compliance, explainability. Uh, the problem with the AI is that it's like a black box in many scenarios. And there are many industries where you have to have complete visibility into anything that is happening with your data. Um, and those, uh, if you're using AI in certain scenarios, it is not going to give you that information. So you must identify the areas where you can use it without being able to explain what is happening inside this black box. So it's a kind of a design problem where you look at your uh, scenario and figure out that where you can fit in this black box and that you are going to be still okay from the compliance perspective, uh, from uh, explainability perspective. Uh, so that is one, uh, one issue. And um, with the right design, of course, it can be addressed. And uh, then, of course, uh, the second uh, part would be about the data itself that you have. Sometimes data is suitable. Sometimes uh, it is not suitable for AI. For simple scenarios, AI is an overkill. If you have uh, a simple source database that you want to move it to your data warehouse, you don't need AI for that. You can simply plug in a standard ETL and it is going to be much more cost effective and it is going to be able to bring your data from source to destination um, much quicker compared to using AI. So that's what we recommend that look at your scenario, do the evaluation about how you want to use AI, if it is even applicable, if it is, then where does it go inside your use case? And that's how we go about designing a, um, a tailor-made solution for each of our customers.
in your experience of working with generative AI in the ATL context and onboarding people into these workflows, what are the most interesting or innovative or unexpected ways that you have seen the AI used in the context of ETL? Yeah, interesting uh, question. So this is, uh, I would say, all of it <laughs> that we have seen or what, what I've said uh, so far. So when it started out, pretty much every other week, we'll see something that we have never thought about being addressed by uh, generative AI. So that was a phase for about uh, six months where every uh, couple of weeks we see something that we never thought could be done and it was there. So uh, I, of course it is still going on, but we see this pace kind of a, you know, a slowing down on, on the new innovations uh, using generative AI in ETL. But the most common ones I would say is uh, use of uh, AI to get the insight from unstructured data. And I'll give you an example for that. So we had uh, a use case where we had to get certain answers from our documents as if you're asking a question that, okay, hey, read this document and tell me what is the answer to this question. And uh, this is a very common pattern in um, data insight gathering. And we had a solution that, of course, worked pretty reasonably, but this scenario, to implement this scenario, it took us about a good six man months to write the right uh, solution, build it, test it and all that. And uh, we started to experiment with uh, OpenAI's APIs. And of course we had to, to experiment with the prompts and uh, uh, when the solution, when the data comes in, uh, we had, we ran into some issues on that front as well, but eventually once it was done, the results were better than what we had earlier. And it was done within one week. So that's the extent of uh, uh, savings we are talking about, six months versus one week. And solution is even, and the results are better. So when it comes to unstructured data, text, images, and all that, it's beautiful. The solution uh, based on generative AI, they are way better than what we had earlier. And uh, then uh, the next trend was uh, semantic mapping. This is another one where we saw that our users struggled. Back in the day, we had uh, basically auto map uh, features where we will um, try to figure out um, that uh, column name in the source, what should it belong to in the destination? We had a bunch of heuristics. We had, uh, we, we used to call it smart mapping. <laughs> And uh, the smart mapping was okay. It used to do like, uh, I would say about 60, 70% accurate, but still there was a lot of errors. Um, come into picture uh, AI again, and uh, we started to use the semantic mapping and we give the context. And now the accuracy goes up to about 95%. So we have seen kind of a, almost like a, a magical results in certain areas. One more that, uh, that is very uh, interesting experience, at least uh, personally for me, was uh, creating the data models uh, for data warehousing. Data warehousing, data modeling is not easy. <laughs> for practitioners who have been in the field for decades, they still take time figuring out what should be um, a fact, what should be a dimension, how they should be connected, and what, what kind of a, um, configurations you want to do for facts and dimensions and also for other architectures such as data vault and all that. So we did another experiment where we took our transactional database and uh, created a data model out of it. So we have a reverse engineering functionality that can create the model automatically. No problem on that front. Once we have the data model, we let the AI decide for us that how should you convert this by denormalizing and creating a star schema field. And again, the results were amazing. It was almost like magical. We, we get the right prompts, we get the right information, and there comes a data model uh, that looks like a, a perfect star schema that would otherwise have taken several days of iterations and back and forth with your subject matter experts and the data architect uh, was done in a matter of a few seconds again. So these are the few uh, interesting um, usage uh, uh, scenarios that I can think of, but there are many. Uh, to summarize, I would say that uh, wherever uh, you have patterns and patterns have been applied in past, 
it is known to the practitioners and it is repetitive. Let AI do the decision making for you and you will not be um, disappointed. It is going to do a pretty good job. At least the first cut is going to be amazing. And then, of course, you know, uh, as we talked about earlier, you can take that and override it if need be. And in your experience of working in this space of ETL for so long and the introduction of generative AI as a solution in this process, what are the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned? Yes. Uh, on uh, Early on, I would say we, and actually like, like anyone else, uh, we... We thought that it can do uh, much more um, uh, in terms of even uh, looking at the data and uh, being more deterministic, I would say. The solutions were not that, uh, or the results were not that satisfying. So we had to kind of uh, take a step back and uh, redo the, all of the, all that work. So it will sometimes make mistakes about simple things. Like, I know I'm asking for, what is the location of a specific field in my file? And we'll make a mistake in that. That you can basically with the naked eyes, you can see that, hey, it is in line number two and the 10th character. It can't even figure out that. It will make mistakes. And if you run it twice, three times, four times, maybe once it will give you the right results. So anything where you're relying on giving any deterministic answers, forget about it. So we decided that wherever uh, precision is required, it is not a good fit. Um, because we were trying with pretty much everything that is out there. We were trying uh, out uh, uh, even the, the figuring out the locations. Uh, so we have actually an unstructured data extraction uh, module that can, um, uh, based on templates, it can uh, extract data points from your document. And uh, we were trying to build a template using uh, AI. And for that, you need to get the locations of certain fields and patterns and using which you can build uh, the template. And it was not a good experience. So <laughs> we would try to do that. And uh, uh, every single time you run, you get a different result. And the whole algorithm will be messed up. So anything that is uh, indeterministic, uh, it's OK to use uh, for those scenarios. But where do you expect uh, precise results? It's, it's not going to be a good fit. So barring that, uh, I think it has been uh, pretty useful. Uh, but just keep in mind, whenever you're designing something, go make sure that uh, uh, you look at it carefully and see that are you expecting precise results? If yes, then be careful. Uh, otherwise, approximate results. If you're OK with 95%, if you're OK with 90%, you're good. But if you want 100%, please do not use it. You already mentioned this a little bit, but what are the cases where AI is the wrong choice for ETL applications? And you should just go with, just, just do it manually, write the code, uh, use the low code tool. <laughs> yes. So uh, apart from what I said already, that is for simple scenarios. Uh, so if you have just a handful of sources, structured data mostly, and uh, your destination is also neatly defined, ETL is still going to be more cost effective and it is going to be actually a better choice. Uh, whereas if you have uh, more complex data, you have unstructured data, you have uh, uh, scalability issues, as in your scale can grow, uh, the volume of data can grow, um, and then uh, your overall data ecosystem or the entire uh, data management uh, platform that you're looking at, it has to be more um, able to handle more complexity in future then we would recommend that you use AI-based solutions or start using AI. But if it is a standard, a simple uh, data pipeline that is going to be building your data warehouse or a data integration use case, it is not going to be cost effective. Also, it depends on uh, other aspects of implementation. That is, uh, how um, well-trained is your team? How big is your team? What kind of resources you have at your disposal? Uh, if you have a small team, uh, it is, again, it is not uh, going to be um, that uh, uh, applicable to your scenario. And also, uh, it uh, depends on your strategy. That is one more thing um, uh, that I would like to add. Uh, we have seen some smaller teams, but their leadership, they want to bring in AI. If that is a scenario, definitely go for it. Even if it is an overkill in the beginning, 
but it's going to help you in future. So in that scenario, uh, we do recommend that uh, uh, you start using it from the beginning itself so that when the time arrives, you're ready for it. And as you continue to invest in this area, work with customers, work with your own technology stack, what do you see as the future applications for AI, either in ETL specifically, but also in just the broad application of data engineering as a role? Yeah, this is a, a question that uh, that we discuss routinely. <laughs> this is our design meetings. Uh, this is what we talk about, where the market is going, where, what we should be doing. And one topic that is particularly fascinating is to let the AI do the real time or dynamic ETL. That is, the decision making that we do at design time, can that happen in real time? Of course, it comes with uh, it's all, all uh, caveats and all that, but it is uh, most definitely going in the direction where AI can make some decisions about what data streams or what uh, data sets can be merged and how they can be uh, transformed. So transformation tools and all that, maybe it can use your existing tool, but decision-making about how to build the pipeline what pipeline makes sense, that can be given in hands of AI. So kind of dynamic uh, ETL pipelines, this is where I think uh, the future is going, where it can automatically generate those pipelines. And uh, it is going to be more declarative, uh, where uh, you can declare that uh, instructions given to the AI that, hey, if you look at uh, any new data sets coming in for my customers, they must, you must apply this uh, system of records and put this into this destination. This is instruction given to AI. Now it has to do the design, but internal tool sets, it may be using uh, a no code, a low code solution, but it is the user of that, uh, that, that tool set. And it can make the decision for you about how to build that pipeline automatically. So this is uh, something that we, we see that it is going to happen. And uh, uh, of course, so uh, at, we are still in early stages. We have done some experiments too in that on that front. Uh, there are some um, um, obvious issues on that front. Again, we talked about how the decision making, if it goes wrong, what do you do about it? So there's still some questions we have to answer on that front, uh, but it is definitely going in the direction where uh, AI can do a little bit more decision making at a higher level, and it can uh, dynamically build the ETL flows for you. All right. Are there any other aspects of the applications for generative AI in the ETL workflow or just the overall ecosystem of data engineering and the ways that AI is going to impact it that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? So one area that we see where AI is particularly good at, that is uh, anomaly detection. So, and it has been um, uh, not only the generative AI, even uh, the predecessors of AI, uh, generative AI that is, in past, I would say almost like a decade, they have been used in certain scenarios like uh, fraud detection. So if you give uh, a time series data, it can figure out where something is wrong and it can uh, help you with that. So that specific use case now is being used, uh, is applied to ETL as well. That is something that uh, I, I see that it is being uh, more frequently used. And uh, briefly we touched upon um, in the context of uh, the runtime errors and monitoring of your ETL workflows. So this is uh, of course just one part of it, but we can use AI to detect anything that is going on wrong. So here's my pattern. Here is how we use it. If you see something wrong, let us know. So it can be your eyes into uh, the runtime. And uh, also, of course, for the data sets itself. So not only the, uh, the runtime, you can have a side process that can be looking at your incoming data sets. And beforehand, in profiling stage, if you see something um, drastically wrong or, or different from what you expect, it, uh, uh, you can uh, kind of short circuit the entire pipeline and handle it in a different way. So anomaly detection in the data itself and the metadata, these are the two areas where um, I see that uh, AI can uh, be a huge help.
All right. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as the final question, I'd like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today. This area is uh, changing rapidly. And uh, a lot of tools at this point, they are early beta stage, sometimes alpha stage. And uh, new tools are coming pretty much every every week. We see something new being launched. But one thing that I would love to see is uh, more natural language-based uh, UX. So as of now, the standard is, again, drag and drop UI. That is a golden standard where uh, for any ETL uh, platform or all data management tools, basically, the graphical user interface based uh, tools, the drag and drop is the standard. I would like to see the natural language being implemented where you should be able to, to speak with your tool set and it does the work for you. So that is something that is, uh, of course, in, um, in some products, including our product, it is uh, starting out in certain areas, but um, that can be taken to the next level. And I'm expecting that in within the next few months, it should be there. That will be the bridge between the AI, specifically generative AI, and the ETL tool sets. So that is going to be kind of connecting the users with the tool sets in a much more meaningful way. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and share the experiences you've had with bringing AI into the ETL workflow. It's definitely a very interesting topic area, definitely one that is constantly moving. So I appreciate you uh, sharing your perspective on that and helping people get a leg up on that journey. So uh, thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.